Wow, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. It's an honor to see all the new faces who's joining us. Um, thank you. Thank you for coming and um, being part of this, even if it's for this day. And, you know, thank you to everyone else for coming. Those who serve, um, I don't think we say it enough in any capacity. We just want to say thank you. As leaders here, as pastors here, um, it's appreciated, truly. No matter what capacity you serve in, whether it's at Rock, whether it's um, food, whether it's donating, whether it's at Fresh Coast, whatever it is, we, we just want to say thank you. And it truly means a lot. And um, it's interesting, Bob mentioned something about praying for strangers last week. He didn't even know what we were going to be, well, what I was going to be sharing on this week. So we're starting a series in this next three to four weeks. I'm not going to be preaching everyone, by the way. But thanks, Bob. It's going to be different speakers speaking on different aspects of hospitality. That's what it's going to be about. Obviously, that's what we're called to, to be a hospitable people, to love people, to love our neighbors. The greatest commandment, right? Love the Lord God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. And so before I even get started, there's a short video that I want to share. But before we share that, this whole thing came from a trip we took, about uh, eight of us leaders went to Orlando, Florida this couple months ago to an exponential conference, and it was all about evangelism. And one of the sessions was on the table, and the, the whole premise of that was actually loving your neighbor, literally. Not your neighbors in the city, we're called to do that, right? Where you live, the city you're in, the county you're in, the world, we're called to love them. but this particular speaker broke it down, is narrowing it down to, hey, what if we took Jesus' commandment seriously and literally and actually loving our literal neighbors, who most of the time, most of us don't even know. So that was what that was about. It was a great message and all that. And so we came back with the idea of, hey, we want to kind of, it had some great impact also. And so we wanted to kind of implement that and at least share that and give you a taste of, uh, of kind of what we heard, but it's not going to be just about the table. There's going to be different aspects of hospitality that you will be hearing throughout the weeks. It's going to be real good, and so we encourage you to come. So, Luke, if you are, I'm sorry, Jacob, if you want to play that quick clip. Right time after time in the Bible, we see Jesus sharing a meal with people today, all for the sake of relationship. In next coming weeks, Through these acts of love, he displayed personal. the true As I was of hospitality. Studying for this, I was and it's this kind of radical not only about love that breaks the message, every chain and sets prisoners free. Happening. Matthew 22, in 37 this through 40. City, in this Jesus county, replied, in the last couple you weeks, must love the Lord your God with all your heart, heart, all your soul, people dying. and all your mind. This people is the first dying of and drugs, greatest people dying of overdoses A second and all other is things. equally so important. Kind of love and I'm your going neighbor to tie it as into yourself. this message of the table the because it's law about radical the hospitality, the loving our neighbors. Based on these two commandments. Look, this is not a radical guilt trip on any of us. I was convicted. What if one of them bodies they found could have been invited over for dinner one day when that happened to them? And this is, like, again, this is not a condemning thing. It's just a conviction that stirred up in my heart, and I hope this message today stirs up your heart to love more, to extend hospitality more, to send that text, to invite that person over to dinner or lunch, that stranger, which we're going to see the scripture commands it. And so that's what this is about. It's about just fulfilling the great commandment. That's what we're called to do. The only thing about this Christian walk that's about us is initial salvation. Yes, we grow through the whole thing right to the end. But the only thing about us is salvation. Soon as we're saved, it automatically turns from us to people. It's all about loving people. Jesus came for the people. And we're going to get into that. And I pray that this, this message stirs your, stirs your hearts. I believe it will. It did mine just, just going through it. So hospitality, what does it even mean? We're going to look at the definition of hospitality and then some biblical definitions of hospitality in the Greek. So hospitality, the friendly and generous reception and entertainment of guests, visitors, or 
strangers. The friendly and generous reception and entertainment of guests, visitors, and strangers. You know, I, I wrote this down and I got a lot of notes because the Lord kept changing it up, up in, just up until this morning. <laughs> You see, God has always been forming a hospitable people to put his hospitality on display. And if you are in Christ, you are now part of God's hospitable people. That's what we're called to be, hospitable, friendly, loving our neighbors. So that's the definition of hospitality. But let's look at the Greek because I'm going to go somewhere with this and just pay attention. Look at these Greek definitions of hospitality. If you will, put them up here on the screen, please. <clears throat> no, there, is there one before that? Okay, right here. I don't know how to pronounce these if you can help me out. <laughs> Philoxenia. <laughs> Philoxenia, which literally means lover of strangers. In other words, according to the Bible, hospitality doesn't just refer to us hosting our friends and family well, which it does. It doesn't just refer to that. Go on to the next one. A lover of strangers. A second Greek word for hospitality Zeno Docio, Docio, <laughs> yeah, right, is a, is a compound of Zenos, which means stranger or someone without the knowledge of, without a share in, and dikomai, which means receive, accept, take with the hand, to give ear to, embrace, or even to receive into one's family to bring up or educate. Hospitality then extends even to taking by the hand and embracing into one's family the other one who has no share in or knowledge of one's own identity, life, and values. Think about that definition, what it means in the Greek to be hospitable. Does that sound familiar? Ephesians 2, 11 through 13 says this. Therefore, remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who are called un uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you, this is all of us, me, were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope, and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Jesus Christ. We were those strangers. We were the ones on the outside looking in. We were the outcasts. Until Jesus, in his hospitality, called us in and drew us in into his family like Bob talked about last week, into this royal priesthood. This is who we were. It's not no longer who we are. We've been drawn into the kingdom of God, into the family of God. But now we're called in an individual level to do just what he done for the whole world. It's to bring us into this family of God that we should do the same. If ever... There has been a stranger in need, someone completely excluded and hopeless, like we just read, fully dependent on the grace of another. That is us. We were out in the cold, victims of our own folly, freezing to death from the coldness in our own hearts. And throughout history, God opens the door, rescues us, and welcomes us back into relationship through sheer inexplicable hospitality and grace. Man, this, this act of hospitality, it's, it's strong in the Bible, especially if you read the Old Testament. All throughout the Old Testament, 
you see these acts of hospitality from Abraham when angels came to him. The first thing he said, hold on, stay here. Let me go get some bread. When a man of God, one of the prophets came, the first thing, let me go get some bread. It was always an act of hospitality in the Old Testament. I mean, they took this so seriously, the act of honoring a guest. Listen to this, and this is, and this is crazy. <laughs> There, there's a couple instances in the Bible, Lot, Genesis, I believe it's Judges, um, 17 or 18, I'm not sure, where these guests came into a home and the men of that city wanted to go and do something to those men. It says they wanted to know them. That means they wanted to rape them. They wanted to have sex with them. That's Men wanted to go take these other men out of the home. But the ones who host them said, no. Take our daughters. Crazy, right? But this is in the Bible. They honored the act of hospitality so much that they were willing to sacrifice their daughter's purity to honor the guest in their house. I understand we live in a different culture. We're not called to do nothing like that. But I'm just trying to give you an idea of how serious and how strong that they took the act of hospitality throughout the Bible. One of the things that, um, that I've been given to do is introduce the hospitality at the table. Come here, Mama. You okay? You know how, you know, that's uh, sometimes when we react real, like when we get scared, that scares them even more. So you got to try to, <laughs> you got to try to be like, oh, that's all right. You got this. Uh, right? <laughs> Yeah, wow. Hebrews 13, 2 says this. Do not forget to entertain strangers, for by doing so, some have unknowingly or unwittingly entertained angels. You know that scripture? Think about that. This Bible tells us do not forget to entertain strangers, because by doing so, you could actually be entertaining or hosting an angel and you don't even know it. How many times, and I get it, I get it. Some of them are there by their own choices, by their own reasons. But how many times have we drove by strangers on the streets and just ignored them? Because it's their fault. They could get a job. I get that. There's wisdom in all of this. But you never know when you will be tested. You will never know if one of them times, that man at the store that's sitting out there, that we think just wants our money to go buy drugs, could actually be an angel. I've heard testimonies of that. I've heard testimonies of this man in California, this man of God, this guy asked him for something. And he gave him something. And he said, God bless you, thank you. The, the man smiled. And he, and he turned around, and he, and he turned back around, and the man was gone, and the money was on the ground. <laughs> Crazy, right? But it's real. It's real. We've all been invited to the table of the Lord, to the wedding feast of the Lamb. All of us. All of us. There's a table that we're going to sit at one day there. But not only that, the Bible says he prepares a table before us in the presence of our enemies. That means not only are we going to partake of this great wedding feast one day in heaven, but God says, listen, I'm preparing a table for you right now in the presence of your enemies. There's no enemies in heaven. So that table that he's prepared for us is right now on earth. And for those who accept, and those who accept, it says... He has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. The Bible talks about in Matthew this, this great wedding supper where, you know, he says, hey, a lot of people's invited. Go invite them all. But a lot of them are going to 
make excuses. And I know in context he's talking about the Jews. He's talking about his own people, and he says they're going to make excuses, but we do the same thing today. And then he says we'll go out into the highways and byways and invite everyone in. Invite them on the street. Invite them lame. Invite the poor. Invite the broken. That's what we're called to do right now while we're here on earth is to prepare a table for others. Part of the table, you know, part of the meanings of the table, I mean, there's so much involved with the table. There's community. There's relationship. That's where intimacy is formed. That's where your desires and concerns are shared. It's a place of trust. How many, how many here, all right, there's many married here right now. How did you get to know your wife or how did you get to know your husband? For those dating, even for me and Rachel, one of, the, one of the most intimate ways of us getting to knowing each other was always going out to eat. True? Is it how many for you? How, how many of you took your date out to dinner or you talked on the phone? But pre- predominantly, well, we used to talk on the phone a while back. I don't think people do that very much anymore. But it was always some conversations over dinner. Everything. That's where, that's where people share their secrets. That's where people reveal their, their, their wounds and their hurts and their pains. And you're vulnerable and you just share things with something over a meal. There's something about that table. There's something about the meal where you just share. Pete, I'll give Pete a shout out. He starts something here that we do every so often, every month he wants to do it. It's called the table. And it's simply just over here in the fellowship hall, and it's just inviting people to eat for no other reason. Just come and fellowship with us here at the table. And that was all before we even went to uh, Orlando. So he was probably prophetic, huh, Pete? <laughs> Listen to what this... And this says right here, the table, the table metaphor in Christian theology is rich and multivalent. I don't know that word. It's, I looked it up. I said, I never heard that. I saw this quote, multivalent, valent, multivalent. Anybody know what that means? Wow. See that? Nobody. We said somebody's going to know what it means. Look it up. Multivalent. Tables are where enemies become friends. Tables are where dividing walls of hostility are torn down. Tables are where generosity is extended toward those who were otherwise excluded. Christians behold God's generosity at the Lord's table and extend this generosity towards outsiders with their own tables. In the Bible, the table... It's, it's everywhere. Jesus did it all the time. Everywhere he went, he was at a table. The table is where, and you look up John 13, 14, 15, 16, that's where Jesus expounded so much when he was at the table in that upper room. The table is when the woman with the alabaster flask went and broke it and poured it on his head and wiped his feet. He sat at his enemy's table. He sat at the Pharisee's table. That's when that actually happened. He sat at Matthew's table where the religious people said, why are you, eating, why are you doing eating over there? Don't you know who that is you're eating with? If this Jesus knew who that was, or this, I mean, that he was constantly condemned, but he was eating at table after table after table because he knew something. He knew that's the place of community He knew that's the place of intimacy, the place of love. When you're sitting at the table, when you're sharing a meal, the Bible calls that a refreshing of your heart. In Genesis 18, I said this, when Abraham entertained the strangers, he said, let me get you a morsel of food so that you can refresh your heart. Judges 19, the same thing, the story I just mentioned a minute ago. The man said, no, stay here and let me serve you some bread. Let me get you some food so that you can refresh your heart. 
I just want you to think about all these things because as this goes on today, as this message goes on, I, I want us to be um, intentional and convicted about the table, about this hospitality and generosity to others. It's a place of revelation. Like I said, John 13 through 16, Jesus began to reveal so much in those chapters, and it was all in the upper room at the table. It's a place of feet washing. It's a place where he humbled himself. It's a place of humility and honor. I mentioned what's going on in this city, right? People are broken. People have been rejected. People have never even been honored to come sit at a table. And maybe they have, and maybe they, they blew it. But that doesn't give us no, any reason to not to continue to try to invite them over, to speak life into them, to try to understand what they're going through. Even here at this church, we have a mix of different people. Maybe some of us, and, and look at the one with the tattoos on their faces or the necks and says, hey, I wonder, um, I wonder what's their story. Go talk to them. Invite them over for dinner. And if you don't feel comfortable about inviting them to your house right away, invite them to dinner and get to know them. And vice versa. Maybe it's somebody that I just mentioned and they're looking at one of the older couples and like, oh, they probably, they're, they're too good for me or they probably don't want to talk to me. Go ask. Go talk to them. Go ask them their story. You invite them to lunch. That's community. That's the table. That's getting to know each other. And especially here at Kingdom Life, I believe we, we, we're big on that. We're big on at least trying. Do we get it right all the time? Of course not. Nobody does. No church does. But that's what we're called to do. And I'm not just talking about here at Kingdom Life. I'm talking about the church as a whole. We're called to love people. We're called to do community. We're called to do life. We're called to, to share each other's burdens, like Galatians says. Bear one another's burdens. That's what the scripture says. I know many people here who, who host and invite people to their homes. And that's a beautiful thing. And I get it. I get it. We don't live in the same culture. Well, Ray, you can't just invite everybody to your house. You just can't do that. You got to use wisdom, and that's true. But we can't use wisdom as a guise for our underlying fear we can't, and selfishness, exactly. That's the other word I had written down there, too. Yeah, and I forgot it, and you just said it. We get, truly, we can't use wisdom as a guise to cover our underlying fear and selfishness. Or well, what about on the other hand? Look what I'm doing. All right? Pride. You got one ditch over here, and you got one ditch over here, but if it's all about the posture of our heart. It's all about the posture of our heart. Sometimes it can be fear. Sometimes it can be selfishness. Other times you can do all these things, but it's really just out of pride. Look at me. Look at what I'm doing. All on Facebook and everything else. Now, there's nothing wrong with testimony for testimony's sake. I don't want to, don't get it twisted. You know, there, we got to share testimonies. We got to, like, our brother just shared today about the phone. That was awesome. The hospitality that lady showed just in that store. I don't know what George did. He just said, he said, God bless you all. He told his story. Hey, I had to rake some leaves. For... He wasn't doing that to make them feel sorry for him. He didn't share that story expecting that to happen. It, it, he was just being George. But that lady, whoever she was, God bless her soul, she saw an opportunity to be hospitable even in a place that's not her own. Called him out there, called him back, and paid for his phone for three months. That's awesome. He didn't tell you the rest. He told me, he said, man, he said he cried, got down on his knees and said, praise God, right there in the store. Luke 22. Luke 22, 24. Remember the table? Remember when Jesus washed the disciples' feet? He humbled himself, and he honored them. 
So at the table, when we invite people over to our house, when we invite people to the table, people who can't pay us back. The Bible says, if you love only those who love you, what good is that? Or if you give to somebody who can give back to you, what good is that? The Bible teaches us to bless and honor people who can't pay us back. Because there's a place in there. There's a place of humility on our part, and there's a place of honor on their part. People just need to know that they're accepted, that they're honored because they've been hurt, abused, abandoned, rejected all their life. And when, some, when one of us just says, hey, I want to know what you're going through. I, I just want to hear your story. Come over. Let me take you to lunch. Let's talk. You're actually honoring that person. So Luke 20, um, 22, I'll just, I'll just read it, starting at verse 24. Now there was also a dispute among them as to which of them should be considered the greatest. And he said to them, the kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and those who exercise authority over them are called benefactors. But not so among you. On the contrary, he who is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he who governs as he who serves. For who is greater, he who sits at the table or he who serves? Is it not he who sits at the table? Yet I am among you as one who serves. This is our king, our master. This is his example. But I sit among you as one who serves. But you are those who have continued with me in my trials, and I bestow upon you a kingdom, just as my father bestowed one upon me, that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom and sit on thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. You hear what Jesus is saying here? The greater one is the one being served, but yet he came to serve. So can you imagine how much honor is bestowed on those who we invite to sit at the table and we do the serving? We're called to lay down our lives in this thing, but we don't even want to lay down a tablecloth. We, don't, we just don't want to do it. And I'm not talking about all of us. I'm not making a, a blanket statement. I'm just talking to us and inspiring us as a church, as a whole. We're called to wash feet. But too many of us want a title and don't want to pick up a towel. Sometimes that's the way it is. He who is greatest among you, let him be the servant of all, the Bible says. Think about that. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, and in due time, he'll exalt you. The, the, the quickest way to be exalted in the most purest form is to humble yourself. God knows the innate desire in each one of us. It's in us, that, that wanting to be seen by man thing. It's in, it's in all of us to one degree of measure or another. It's in all of us, that pride, that wanting to be seen by man. Look at the good deeds I'm doing. I get it. It's in us. But God says... Humble yourself and I'll exalt you. Why would God exalt us if he don't want us to be exalted? He wants us to be humble, but he says, when you do that, I'll exalt you. Because he knows as you humble yourself and he exalts you, it will be done in the purest form and you won't be prideful. You'll become a servant king. This man, this woman, they know how to serve. So I'm going to put them up here because I know they're going to take care of my people. I know they're going to love them. They're going to serve them. So the table is a place of honor and humility, like we just read. But it's also a place of restoration. It's a place where people are restored. It's a place where people are healed. In John 21, after Jesus was resurrected, oh, I got to go there because I got to show you guys this. John 21 is so good. If you want to go there with me, John 21. So Jesus is resurrected. The disciples went fishing. Many of you know this story. If not, read it. It's awesome. Read the whole Bible. Continue to read it. Stay in it. For real, it's, we, we need to get in. I love this thing, and, I'm, and I say that not out of pride. I... I like, even if I didn't want to be up here, I can't help it. 
I didn't put myself up here. I just love this thing. I love the Word of God. I love reading it. I love studying it. It's just, it's just what I'm called to do. But I promise you, it's the best thing you can do. This is the bread of life. Speaking of food, speaking of the table, this is the greatest table you will ever sit at, eat at, anything right here. The Word of God, the bread of life. So Jesus is... is He sees them fishing, and this is after his resurrection. I'm not going to read it all, but they're on the boat, and Jesus yelled to them, you know. He said, um, where am I going with this? Let me see what scripture I want to start at. Verse 5 in chapter 21, he said, then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food? You know, and they said no. He told them to cast the net on the right side of the boat and so on. Verse 15. After they knew it was Jesus, they ran to the shore. Peter was the first one. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, now, let me back up. The table is a place of restoration. Watch this. Peter just denied Jesus three times. He just denied him. Notice something, though. He knows Peter's tore up inside. I mean, he appeared to them before, but... It wasn't a full restoration. He just let him know I'm, I'm back. But well, here's Peter. He's he's because Peter's the one who said I'm going fishing. He was still distraught. He's still confused. Like man, probably didn't know what's what. So he said, "Man, I'm going fishing." He went back to what was comfortable. First of all, there's a meaning in that. He was a fisherman. He thought you know it was over. Whatever. Notice what he went back to. Many of us can relate. We go back to what's comfortable for us. So he went fishing. And I love this because, again, Jesus said, when they had eaten breakfast. So what he did is he called Simon and he said, Simon Peter, do you love me? He was restoring Peter from them three denials. But notice he did it after breakfast. Why? Because Jesus knows the importance of this principle. Ain't it interesting that how we go right to people and, and we want to we wanna know their problems or tell them what they should be doing, shouldn't be doing, but we don't want to provide no hospitality of a table. Peter, uh, Jesus understood the principle. Before he even went to Peter and, and, and even to restore him or talk about anything, he knows Peter's hurting. The first thing he did was invite him to lunch. Breakfast, in this point. Do you see what I'm saying? Do you see the principle of the table? Do you see how important it is that even Jesus made sure Peter had breakfast before he went to talk to him about an important matter of restoration? And then he says, Peter, do you love me? Yeah, Lord, you know I love you. Second time. You love me? Yeah, Lord, you know I love you. Third time, do you love me? He asked Peter three times. Third time, Peter said, Lord, you know all things. You know I love you. And listen to what he said, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. I get it. I understand he's talking about spiritually, but there's also a correlation to physically. He's saying, you're going to take care of my people. Notice this. He denied them three times. He restored them to the same measure. He asked them three times, do you love me? God has a redemptive solution for every problem we will ever face. And I love that. Do you love me? Well, then take care of my people. We back up real quick, and then he asked Peter before, when Peter said, you're not going to go to the cross. And Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. And then he said, Satan is asked to sift you like wheat. He said, you're going to deny me three times. He said, but I pray for you that your faith not fail. Right? Listen to this. I pray for you that your faith not fail. And when you return, strengthen your brethren. Think about that principle real quick. He said, Peter, you know what? You're going to miss it. You're going to blow it. But I'm praying for you that your faith not fail. 
And when you return, strengthen your brethren. I think that's so powerful for all of us. When we miss it, when we blow it, we have Jesus, our advocate, praying for us that our faith not fail. We might fail. We might blow it. But he's praying that our faith not fail. And there's lessons to be learned in these failures because he told Peter, when you return, strengthen your brethren. That means you're going to learn something from this. You're going to grow even stronger. And now you're going to be able to help someone else because of what you went through, because of that failure. That wasn't a part of the table, but that was just what the Lord put on my heart for somebody here. You might have blew it, you might have missed it, but guess what? Jesus is praying for you that your faith not fail. I think that's amazing that he's, he's praying that prayer for us right now, that our faith not fail. So what is this table thing mainly about? It's all about love. It's all about love, the greatest commandment. I said it earlier. Love the Lord with all your heart, soul, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. But you know, he did upgrade even that. In John, he says, love one another as I have loved you. Why did he change it from that loving God with all your heart, soul, and neighbor? That still counts. That still stands. Just hear me. He's not... Before I get somebody in here, oh, brother, you know, <laughs> you know, somebody's going to say something. But no, that, that's the greatest commandment in the law. Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, love one another as I have loved you. See, why? why? Because a lot of us can't love our neighbor as ourselves because we don't even love ourselves. How can we love our neighbor when we don't even love ourselves? So that's why Jesus said, he, and Jesus understood that. That's why he said, listen, now you see how I loved you. I'm giving my life for you. So now you love one another as I have loved you. I think one of the greatest things, one of the, one of the most greatest problems of the church as a whole and as individuals is that we, don't, we can't love our neighbor because we truly don't have a revelation of how much God loves us of how much Jesus loves us. Because when we get that revelation of how much Jesus loves us, I believe then we'll be able to love our neighbor the way he calls us to. Hmm. In Revelation 3.20, listen to this, watch this. Hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears and opens the door, I will come in, and I will dine with him, I will sup with him. What do you think that knock is? What do you think that knock is? When he says he's at the door knocking, he's knocking at the door of our heart, and you know what that knock is? That knock is the hungry, that knock is the destitute, that knock is the lonely, that knock is the broken, Think about what I'm saying. In this text, in context, he's talking to the church in Revelation. He's not, I know we use it as an evangelistic scripture, but in context, he's talking to the church. He's standing outside the door of his own church knocking. Ain't that crazy? We could be having church while the Lord's outside knocking at the door of the church, of our hearts. That knock is the hungry, the destitute, the lonely, the broken. And when we answer that call, that knock, we let him in. Go to Matthew 25, and I'll explain what I'm talking about. Matthew 25, verse 41. Oh, I don't know where I'll start, but... Oh, how much time I got. Yeah, I got time to read this. Listen to this. Think about what I just said. Jesus is knocking at the doors of our hearts. But that knock, if we rightly discern it again, it's the hungry, the destitute, the lonely, the broken, the addicted, the prisoner. All of these things is that knock on our heart. And when we answer that knock, when we answer and open up, we let him in. Matthew 25, verse 34, or verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the holy angels with him, 
Oh, y'all, listen to this. I know you know this, but listen to this, please. Then he will sit on the throne of his glory, and all the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate them one from another as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats, and he will set the sheep on his right hand and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Talk about hospitality. That sums it up. And listen to what he says. Listen to the rest. Then the righteous will answer him, all the ones he just told that to, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? When did we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? Or when did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, Assuredly, verily, verily, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. I, I mean, I can really just stop preaching right there, honestly. Talk about hospitality. These are Jesus' words, and this is serious. And then, I'm not going to read it all, but then the goats, on the other hand, they said, Lord, when did we see you um, hungry and not feed you? When did we see you in prison and not visit you? And he said, when you didn't do it to them, you didn't do it to me. So the opposite. He said, when you feed these when you clothe these, when you take them in, when you visit them in prison, when they're sick and you minister to them, he said, it's just like you're doing it to me. That's that knock I just said at our hearts. When we open that door and let him in, when we open that door for them, we let him in. This is serious. <clears throat> I mean... I believe, personally, I'm not going to get into it. I believe we're in the last days. I believe we're that last generation. I don't know what anybody's end time eschatology is. We're not here to dispute, dispute that or debate about that. I'm just telling you my beliefs. I believe we're that generation. And I know they've been saying that forever, but guess what? We got everything. We got the technology. We got the countries in place. We got everything in place. I believe we're that generation. And we're worried about stupid things. We're fighting over doctrines. We're fighting over who's right and who's wrong with the scriptures. We're carnal. Paul said that, not Ray. And if he, in 1 Corinthians, he said, one says I'm a Paul, one says I'm a Paulist. He said, aren't you acting like mere carnal men? He said, who are we? Just ministers of the gospel. But that's every denomination right now. That's the same exact thing. I'm Paul. I'm Apollos. That's what, the, that's really, honestly, to me, that's what denominations represent. I'm sorry if I'm offending you. That's just the truth. And he says, when you do things like that, when you're dividing yourself, ain't you acting carnal? The enemy knows the scripture. He said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. What do you think? <laughs> Yeah, let me get them over there with their little truth. Let me get them over there with their little truth. But I can't have them coming together. I just mentioned that real quick because it's on my heart. We were just talking about that before church. Like, man, we're supposed to come together in unity and just love on people. All of us. And I encourage you to do that. Yeah, this is, we need a place to come and get fed, right? We do. He gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, teachers, pastors for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. We cannot forsake the assembling of ourselves. So this is necessary and needed. But what we need to do better is we need to look outside these walls, not just for the broken out there, but to partner with other churches, other brothers and sisters, so we can help those out there. It could be, yeah. 
yeah, if you're not careful in doing what, what I'm talking about, it can be. Yeah, because non-denominations, I'm sorry if I'm coming off like that. I'm not putting denominations down in a sense. I'm just talking about the body as a whole. There's a broken world out there dying, and we're divided over, again, we're just divided over so much. Guess what? Yeah, one thing we can come together on is the table. We can sit down and eat together and share together. Let's come up with solutions so we can stop people from overdosing and dying out there in the street. Man, that, that, should be, that should be the the defined factor of unity right there. Seeing so many people out here dying. I just heard of a little brother who just died just the other day that I actually sat right there and prayed over him one day. But I haven't seen him in a while. And he died. OD'd, I guess, but had some other health complications. And so what I'm saying right now, listen, this is convicting to me. I can do better at hospitality. I could do better of inviting people to the table. I could do better. We all can do better. Maybe even today, if your heart's stirred, look at somebody. I don't know. You want to go to lunch? I understand it costs money. I get that. Some people say, well, I, I, I I I don't have no money. What do you have? Remember in the Old Testament, Elijah? The widow didn't have nothing, nothing. He said, hey, give me some water. She said, okay, I'm going to go get get you some water. Then he said, while while you're doing that, he said, "Uh, make me a cake and bring it to me. And and she said, man of God, I'm gathering sticks right now because I'm going to make this little last flour and oil that I have, and I'm going to make a cake for me and my son. We're going to eat it and die. Listen to this principle. He said, don't worry about that. You're going to be all right. Go do what I said. She listened. She obeyed the word of God. She went and did that, gave her last, and it multiplied. So there's no excuse if I, this is all I got. Well, then give it to God and see what he does with it. Remember another story of speaking at tables was the 5,000. One of the disciples said, Lord, here's the kid couple fish, some loaves, but what is that among so many? Same excuse. What am I going to do with this? How can I help all these people? And Jesus said, give it to me. He blessed it, broke it, gave it to them, and it multiplied. Do you see what I'm saying? We have no excuse. We have something to offer. And even what Bob said, if it's not something physically, prayer. James says this, faith without works is dead. What good is it you see somebody who's cold and out cold and hungry and you say, hey, go be warm and filled. He said, but you don't give them nothing for the body. That means you don't give them nothing physically. He said, what good is that? Same principle. There's something we got to do. There's something we need to do. Psalm 68, 6 says this. He puts the solitary in families. He puts the lonely in families. He puts the broken in families. Who knows, maybe this message might stir somebody up and they might go adopt the kid who's out there lonely, broken. I don't know. But what we're called to do, it says God puts the solitary in families. Who do you, what family do you think he puts them in? Our families. The solitary means the lonely, the ones who's out there by themselves, the broken. He puts the solitary in families. Romans 15, 1, I'll I'll quote a couple of scriptures and then I'll end it. Romans 15. Fifteen, one through three. Listen to this. We then, who are strong, ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each one of us please his neighbor Please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. For even Christ did not please himself, for it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. I'll just read that first verse again. 
just, just so we can get it. We then who are strong are to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each one of us please his neighbor for his good. Third John, verse 5. Five and six. Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers. You who have borne witness of your love before the church. If you send them forward on their journey in a matter, matter, manner worthy of God, you would do well. Do you see what, again, you see what he's saying? To the brethren and to the strangers. And he says, you do well when you send them forward on their journey. That means you minister to their heart. You speak life into them. You feed them. You give them something. And then you send them on their way. It says you do well and you glorify God when we do these things. 1 Peter 4. I love this one. <clears throat> Verse 7. Again, I just mentioned, I think the season we're in, that's just me personally. Listen, because the last day started right then, back in their days. <clears throat> Peter says this in 1 Peter chapter 4, But the end of all things is at hand. Therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers, and above all things have fervent love for one another, for love will cover a multitude of sins. Be hospitable to one another without grumbling, and as each one has received a gift, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Be hospitable to one another. It says, as each one has received a gift, minister, minister it. What is that gift? That's, each, each of you in this place have a gift. Each of you have something to offer. Again, yes, we're talking about the context of table. Invite people over. Get to know them. Have a barbecue this summer. Invite people over at a fire pit. Do some hot dogs. Like I'm talking about natural food here for a minute, but we can all do that. We can all invite people over, and not just those we know. How about somebody you, you, you met here for the first time or not even here or the stranger out there? Try it. Not because Ray's saying, because that's what this message is about and that's what the Bible says. You read the definitions of hospitality. We see it over and over again. I, again, this goes for me first. I'm convicted. I've been selfish. I haven't humbled myself enough to invite people over to do things. But I promise you one thing, even, getting, e even preparing for this message, I know what me and my wife is going to do. I promise you that. And I just hope that some of you do that. Some are already doing it. Rachel invites people over the house. I can name names. And hey, there's many of you. Maybe we can do better at it, though. I, and I get it, like again, some of us are doing it, continue to do it, great. But I just pray that this just stirs you up to do it. And I was, uh, and as I was sitting there and going through all this, this came to me and I wrote it and I, I wanna say it written down so I don't miss it. It says, ultimately, listen to this, ultimately Jesus is not after your hands. He's after your heart. And when he has your heart, he has your hands. Your table becomes his table. He's not after your hands, he's after your heart. And when he has your heart, he has your hands. And your table becomes his table. Where is your heart? Where is your heart? Jesus said, where your treasure is, 
there your heart will be also. Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus' heart was for the people. They were his treasure. Everywhere he went, he looked at them as sheep without a shepherd, and he ministered to them. He loved them. He fed them. He blessed them. He healed them. And yes, he's Jesus before us. Well, that was Jesus. Well, he calls us to do the same. And he says, greater works we would do because I go to my Father. We each have the Holy Spirit in us. We, we each hear, can hear from him. If we're tuning our ear to him and say, God, help me with this. Help me to be more compassionate. You know, that's one word I didn't really get into, but that word compassion, that goes hand in hand with hospitality. That goes hand in hand with why Jesus did what he did. Scripture says a couple times that Jesus had compassion on the people. He said he saw them as sheep without a shepherd. He saw them lost. He saw them broken. And he just wanted, he just loved on them. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm fired up and compassionate about this thing because, again, it breaks my heart to see people dying out here because they're just lost and broken as sheep without a shepherd. So they don't know what else to do, so they turn to them drugs and to the alcohol, whatever else it is. And some of us even in here, we're going through things. None of us are perfect. I'm just saying, the joy of the Lord is our strength. So if you're weak, if we're down, it says the joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord. What brings him joy? Just what he told Peter, loving people and feeding the sheep. That brings him joy, and we bring him joy. That gives you strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And so once, sometimes the very thing that we need, we will get when we give it. Where's your heart at? Where's my heart at? I know preparing this message, I, I'm telling you, I was stirred up. I said, man, I could do a better job at hospitality. I could do a better job at the table. And throughout this week, you're going to see different aspects of hospitality. So I pray you keep, continue to come back. But be doers of the word and not just hearers only. Take, take this word about the table. Take this word about hospitality and do something with it. And I promise you, you're going to have testimonies to share of somebody that you invited over, somebody that you spoke life into, somebody who shared their intimate secrets at the table, and you didn't even know they were going through it. And you're going to be able to bless them and help them. <clears throat> so, Father, we thank you. Thank you for this word. God, thank you for your great and awesome hospitality and love when we were the strangers, when we were the ones lost, when we were the ones broken, when we were the ones sick, when we were the ones in prison, when we were the ones hungry, and you came to us. And for most of us, you did it through people. You did it through someone else because that's how you work. You use people, God. And so I pray today, as a family, here at Kingdom Life, and even those visiting, that this message, God, will stir their hearts, realize what's important in life, not in the abundance of things we have, because all things come from you anyway, so everything we have is yours. Who are we to hold on to it and be selfish and be greedy? Nothing is ours. We won't take nothing with us. Help us to utilize everything we have, the gifts, the talents, the treasures that you've given us and help us to be like you and bless people. So, Father, bless everyone here this morning. Bless their families and stir up our hearts for this thing, God. Give us hospitable hearts, humble hearts, loving hearts, compassionate hearts so that we can be just like you. In Jesus' name, amen.